Hello there! I am Zolaire Law, and this is The Joy of Computer Gaming, where we investigate good and intriguing examples of computer gaming history. Today's highlighted game is Ultima II Revenge of the Enchantress. The sail around on a ship, shoot sea serpents, and save up for stats so you can survive using a spaceship game. It's a tile-based overhead RPG created by Richard Garriott in 1982 for the Apple II at first, then later on the Atari 8-bit, which is the version I'll be playing, MS-DOS and the Commodore 64 in 1983, and even later for the Macintosh and Atari ST in 1985. I'm including this game because the entirety of the Ultima series holds a lot of sentimental and nostalgic value for me, even though this installment was the worst of the lot that I had played. However, it is the earliest in the series that I've played. This game is rather nonsensical and is filled with inside jokes, breaking the fourth wall, and general goofiness. Even the manual was written in a jovial tone. Anybody that has played later Ultima games should probably pass on this since it has very little in common even with Ultima 3, which came out shortly afterwards. Almost all of the game is played viewing a tiled overhead view of the world around your character. This is done with very simple static images, except for the water, which is done with simple twitching lines. The overworld's rendering code is not very well optimized and has obvious screen tearing. Watching it frame by frame, I can see it takes a few frames to update. When viewing your inventory, it switches to plain text. It draws out slowly on the screen. This always looked really sloppy to me since the text doesn't even wrap properly. It just chops off a word and goes to a new line midword. Intelligence is also misspelled. A few columns and a couple minor abbreviations for the list of your items would go a long way. When you're in space, it has a generic starfield look and even emulates the Star Trek warp look. Though you never leave the solar system, so how would so many stars zip past you? Lastly, there are dungeons and towers, which are a first-person perspective, while some lines are drawn in for walls, doors, and ropes, simple boxes, and very blocky-looking enemies. In the vaguest sense, you are a hero who is tasked with taking down Minax, an enchantress that worked under Mondain, the villain from the first Ultima game. She has come to Earth, caused a massive nuclear war in the future, and has destabilized time on the planet, allowing you to travel through time to five different time periods. 9 million BC, 1423 BC, which is where you start, 1990 AD, 2112 AD, and the Time of Legends, which is where Minax is hanging out. Unlike any of the other games in the series, this game takes place on Earth and in our solar system. Most of the game takes place on Earth, using portals to gate between five different time periods. Even though it's supposed to be on Earth, you can play as an elf, dwarf, or hobbit, and there are orcs, demons, devils, balrons, and sea serpents trying to kill you. Since the map of the game is rectangular, some parts of the world are greatly stretched like those flat maps they often have in elementary schools. Greenland in particular is simply monstrous in size. If you go through where the North Pole would be, you come out the bottom of the map where the South Pole would be, and vice versa. It simply wraps around in all directions. The terrain is simple, being passable on foot, like plains and forests, passable on a ship, which is water of course, or impassable like mountains and walls. The only exceptions are swamps which do a small amount of damage to you every step, and force fields which do a thousand damage each step unless you have the ring. There are various villages, cities, and castles you can visit. There's little point to going to most of them except to buy better weapons, armor, and food unless you're a major cleric, then you can buy spells as well. Giving money to Lord British gives you more health, so you'll be paying him a bit. However, some cities like the village in 2112 AD have some items you can grab as well. When you enter a city, it is reloaded every time. When you go back to an overworld map, its state is however you left it with any ships, horses, planes, and rockets you may have left behind. In 9 million BC, Earth is almost just a single unrecognizable landmass, which is probably supposed to resemble Pangaea, which actually broke apart about 175 million years ago. This whole area is hard to navigate and has a lot of swamp which causes damage to you. Though nothing like humans existed back in 9 million BC, there is still a village here and of course the regular cast of enemies that make no sense here like orcs, thieves, priests, and pirate ships. The Time of Legends is where Minax resides in the center. Aside from a protective barrier of mountains around the area where the portals appear, it's just a giant open circle of plains surrounded by a single ocean. A huge number of powerful monsters stood out here as well. 1423 BC, 1990 AD, and 2112 AD are all very similar to Earth as we know it, though Alaska and Siberia are connected in the earlier two. Some cities and dungeons move around between them. Lord British's castle exists only in 1423 BC and 1990 AD, and seem to be identical in both of them. 2112 AD has several portions of the planet a bit on the messed up side. South America is separate from North America, 
California has drifted away a bit, the Arabian Peninsula is completely missing, and there's a giant watery crater in the middle of Russia. I think it's supposed to be Russia anyways. There's only one village here, and it's the only place on Earth you can get a space rocket. Speaking of the space rocket, once you get the power armor, which requires a 31 strength to equip and costs a fortune, you can head off the planet and into space. The rocket uses trilithiums that you get randomly from killing thieves, which sounds suspiciously similar to dilithium, which is used for warping in the Star Trek series. Try with a Y, by the way, as in they might fail, maybe? The game does tell you the coordinates for the only other world you need to go to, Planet X, at 999. In the water right next to the space rockets are a giant 666 to tell you where Earth is, but you see it as soon as you enter space as well. In fact, the manual lists where all of the planets and the sun are, except for Planet X. The sun kills you, but the other planets can be landed on. There's no real point to going to any of them, though, other than Planet X. When you land your rocket, you must land on planes, or you will die instantly. And lastly, there are the dungeons and towers. You must go down dungeons and up towers. There's no real point to going into these at all. You can play through the entire game without doing so. I have not found any benefits, not even anywhere with a lot of chests like you find in Ultima 3, but I haven't had an incentive to spend much time mapping them either. You can't even view maps of the dungeons or towers with helms like you can with gems in Ultima 3. Most of the commands in the game are done with single key presses. A to attack, E to enter, and so on. Like most Ultima games, Z is for viewing your stats. Moving uses the arrow keys on the Atari without pressing any other keys, which is great if you have a real Atari and very annoying otherwise because up is minus, down is equals, left is plus, and right is asterisk. To make life easier, I just create a custom keyboard in the emulator with the arrows mapped to those keys for playing Ultima 2 and Ultima 3. You can't move diagonally, though the AI can. One very frustrating thing about the controls is that the game doesn't allow delaying key presses even a little. When you get the CMD prompt, anything you had just pressed is cleared. This is the opposite problem we had in Telenguard, but here it would actually be useful because so often you're fighting an enemy by pressing A and then the direction. If the enemy hits you, it delays your prompt by about half a second, so if you're just pressing the keys over and over, you'll slip up and press the direction instead of A at the time the prompt appears. So your choices are to live with it or to attack more slowly. To make matters worse, the key clearing does not apply to pressing the direction keys. This was probably done to make it less annoying to move around, but it further exaggerates the problem when attacking things. The manual even makes a mention of this like it's a feature requiring you to pay more attention to the timing. All I have to say about it is grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
not even a simple healing spell. And my character is female. You choose a gender in this game, but the cleric merchant is calling my character Brother Janna. You still need to get a wand or staff to cast cleric spells at all. And though prayer sounds like it might be useful outside, it just fails there. In a dungeon, it seems to instantly kill your opponent, but when you only get 11 gold out of it and it fails a lot, and it costs over 200 to buy a whopping 5 uses, it just further cements the uselessness of them. So the wizards have got to get something good, right? Right? Wrong. The first three wizard spells are the exact same, but they could also get magic missile, blink, and kill. I only tried Magic Missile, which kills the demon-looking creatures in the dungeons, but honestly, what's the point? It costs so much to get these spells, you have to find a staff or a wand first, and then you can one-shot enemies in the dungeon, which give you a lousy amount of gold and worthless experience. Enemy wizards can blast you from a space away, even through mountains, but you can't even cast spells when you're not in a dungeon. <sighs> when making a character, you have 90 points to distribute. You can distribute less and the game doesn't care, but if you distribute more, it just resets without telling you what you did wrong. The minimum number of points you could put into a stat is 10. If you put less, it again resets without telling you why. There are six attributes. Strength, Agility, Stamina, Charisma, Wisdom, and Intelligence. Strength governs what armor you can wear and supposedly how much damage you do. Agility governs how well you hit, about a percentage chance equal to your agility, as well as what weapons you can equip. Stamina supposedly decreases the damage you take, but I've never noticed it change anything. Charisma lowers prices, Wisdom helps cast Cleric spells, and Intelligence helps cast Wizard spells and lowers prices as well. Then you pick a gender, race, and a class. Males get plus 5 strength, females get plus 10 charisma. For races, dwarves get plus 5 strength, elves get plus 5 agility, hobbits get plus 10 wisdom, and humans get plus 5 intelligence. And for classes, clerics get plus 15 wisdom and can cast Cleric spells, Fighters get plus 15 strength, thieves get plus 10 agility, and wizards get plus 10 intelligence and can cast wizard spells. If you want my opinion, dump everything into agility. Make a male elf thief, though you can play female instead if you want the prices to be lower. Not missing over and over and over is so vital to your survival in the early game, and you need a high agility to equip the final weapon of the game anyways. Unlike just about all other role-playing games, well, except Rings of Zilfin because it's strange, you can just buy yourself more health, up to a maximum of 9999. I really don't understand the logic of this in either game, and pretty much all other CRPGs give you a maximum health, which you start out with instead. If you ever run out of food, you die instantly, so be certain you don't run out of that either. You get experience from killing enemies. Aside from your character sheet saying you are a level X whatever, where X is your experience divided by 100, it does absolutely nothing for you. You also get gold from killing enemies. It's the currency of the game, and boy do you need loads of it. Too bad you pretty much only get it from enemies and only 0 to 17 gold at a time. The AI controlling the enemies is almost non-existent. It will try to get at you in a straight line, orthogonally or diagonally. You can't even move diagonally, so this feels a bit like cheating, but they get stuck on the littlest things, so they need some sort of advantage. This also makes it easy to get the enemies in a giant line when there are a lot of them, particularly in the time of Legends. Enemies simply try to attack and kill you, but there are at least some differences between them. Various enemies just attack you and that's it, like orcs, fighters, clerics, and guards. Guards do massive damage, but at least they drop keys which you need to complete the game. Thieves may randomly steal items from you, but they also drop most of the items in the game, so they are necessary to kill in droves. Sea serpents and pirate ships can only travel through the water. There are enemies that apply debuffs to you. Demons paralyze your legs, devils paralyze your arms, and balrons make you fall asleep. They get to do this and make an attack on you, which is rather annoying. They can also do it from a space away, so they can cause you to fall asleep through walls or mountains or the like. There are items to help defend against those, such as green idols to protect against sleep or boots to protect from leg paralysis, but they aren't guaranteed to work. When enemies are nearly dead, sometimes they will run away from you for a random number of turns. This is both interesting and annoying, but doesn't do much when there are big groups except to prevent them from attacking back. There is a bug when attacking or firing a cannon through the wraparound, which causes you to always miss. For attacking, you can easily cause it over the Siberian-Alaskan Bridge in 1432 BC and 1990 AD. For cannons, you can do it anywhere along the edge of the water. The enemy you are missing can still hit you just fine, however. NPCs in towns that are not trying to attack you either move completely randomly or stand still, except shopkeepers which will follow you. A number of jesters and new jester on Uranus 
also follow you, but aren't aggressive unless you attack them first. Talking to almost all of them, just give a generic response based off the image they are using, so guards will pretty much always say, pay your taxes. Wandering merchants will say, will you buy my apples? Wizards say, hexy poo hex on you. Fighters say, ugh, me tough, and so on. Also, I haven't tested in every city and castle, but it seems there is one completely invincible guard or enemy in each one. You simply cannot hit them even with the ship's cannons. I'm not certain what the point of this is other than to greatly annoy the player. They are also mentioned in the manual. My axe, the final enemy of the game, teleports between two corners of her castle whenever you hit her and hits you with spells from several spaces away. This is particularly frustrating if you have the invincible defender constantly beating on you. There is absolutely no music in Ultima 2. There are a few different sounds which are distinct, some very unique sounding like firing a cannon from the ship, or being hit by an enemy, and they serve their purpose but are nothing extraordinary. Some of the sounds are really annoying or just seem out of place, such as the intro warbles and going through portals. I have never played the first Ultima, nor its predecessor, Akala Beth. I played Ultima 3, a far better game before Ultima 2. This is due to the fact that the first three Ultima games came out around the same time on the Atari 8-bit, and Ultima 3 was the big hit, whereas Ultima was difficult to even get running. Ultima, Ultima 2, and Ultima 3 all had line-drawn walls, and the game Richard Garriott made before the Ultima's Aklabeth used exclusively lines to display graphics. This is a nifty idea in theory, but in practice it comes out a bit odd-looking. Not that I know anything about being a fledgling programmer and using a bunch of lines to draw a first-person perspective game. <clears throat> The only way the wrapping around would logically make sense is if the entire world was a tor shape. We see this same world configuration in many other games, especially the Ultimas including Ultima 3, Ultima 4, Ultima 5, and even Ultima Online. But other games such as King's Quest and Populous The Beginning do this as well, though Populous attempts to cover it up with a faux sphere look. Many other games that have a map for the entire world block off the polar caps to at least seem like cylinder-shaped worlds, like Colonial Conquest, Civilization, and Alpha Centauri. However, most other games with flat maps simply have borders on them to prevent this wrapping around effect, such as Seven Cities of Gold, Machiavelli, Fantasy Empires, or Battletech Crescent Hawk's Inception. Even Ultima 6 ended up using a border to prevent you from wrapping around the world. I went to every single planet in the solar system to see what was there. There wasn't much of interest, really. It makes me wonder why Richard Gary had even bothered having them there, except to say that they were there. It's just a bit sad that you don't see anything going to them. I wouldn't expect anything like Captain Blood when a planet zooms in and you see it's rotating, but even just the map with a simple curve on the edge of the screen would have been nifty, I think, and not too hard to code. Going to the sun kills you for some reason and there's absolutely nothing on Mercury, Venus, or Saturn. Mars and Jupiter have a single city to visit, but it isn't very interesting. Uranus has a very annoying city called New Jester, which has silly terrain drawings, the word HA, and a lot of jesters that follow you and do crazy damage if you attack them. I've also been attacked by the terrain while I was there. Pluto's terrain is somewhat interesting, with difficult spots to land in, some ships and planes you could ride, a pointless city, and an awful dungeon that has lots of trilithium but I couldn't figure out how to get out of that. Oh yeah, and there's a computer camp on Neptune. This apparently contains a lot of inside jokes and references to things in Richard Garriott's life, but it is so out of place it just feels forced in. It is probably a reference to an actual computer camp he attended in 1977 at the University of Oklahoma. Did he feel Oklahoma was like being on Neptune, perhaps? In the game, the city includes a few, I would assume, real people that inspired Richard Garriott to make games, along with several different cabins, a giant smiley face mat of water, force fields, and non-moving orcs stuck in bars, and poor Debbie's pool. Almost all the wandering NPCs are orcs. There's also an orc named Howie the Pest asking Richard Garriott if Ultima 2 will be finished soon, and Richard says, tomorrow for sure. Have you ever landed your rocket on Neptune, only to find it completely barren except for a computer camp? This ever happened to you? Seriously, though. Computer camp on Neptune... Seriously? At least the similar hidden level of the Talus Principle, with loads of in-references as well, was, well, hidden behind a false wall, and didn't feel so ridiculously out of place. I don't know if it's a bug or intended, but in every version of the game I played, the time portals don't show up for the first 400 or so moves of the game. There are two portals that appear near one another in the first stage of 1432 BC at the beginning, 
and I could just sit there for a long time before they finally start showing up. There is a bug with the portals which seems to be hard to cause, but I did get a recording of it. This is in 1423 BC where you start the game. This portal is supposed to take you to 9 million BC. However, if you come at it rapidly, the portals move slightly later than the screen updates, so that portal is still there when you land on the square, then jumps to the next spot. This leaves planes under the portal, even though it's supposed to be forest, and teleports you to where the next portal would take you. Another glitch that isn't really a fault of the game, but if you swap discs on the game then hop through a portal, you get a bizarre funky fun land. In this example, I had the Load Runner disc in on accident when I jumped through. I swapped back to the Ultima 2 disc and hopped into some towns, which are completely normal on the inside, but the world went back to funky fun land when leaving them. I did the reverse with Load Runner, while Ultima 2's save disc was in the drive and wasn't disappointed there either with this impossible stage. You can kill Lord British in this game by simply attacking him. He's generally difficult or impossible to kill in the future Ultima games. Here he's about as tough as a guard, so he's no pushover, but he's not invincible. However, just like the other early Ultima games, if you leave a town or castle and re-enter, everything is respawned, so this never permanently kills him. Richard Garriott appears in the game in the computer camp city on Neptune. You can only get to Neptune from 2112 AD and back on Earth. Lord British and his castle are gone, so technically that means that Lord British falls from power in the future and becomes just Richard Garriott then goes to a computer camp on Neptune, only to end up being badgered about releasing Ultima 2 130 years after he already released it. Before recording for this video, I thought Ultima 2 was a decent game and would have rated it a 6 out of 10. This is unfortunately another case of being blinded by nostalgia. This game got boring very fast, after I realized how little money I got for each kill and realized that I had hours of grinding ahead of me. And as I was recording more and more of my experiences in space, it just got more and more ridiculous and silly. I can only give this game a 4 out of 10. Play any other Ultima, even the dreaded Ultima 8 and 9 games are more enjoyable. Heck, I've even heard people say the first Ultima was a better game, but I've never played it so I can't comment on that. The Apple II version of the game was the original that Lord British created back in 1982. It plays very much like the Atari 8-bit version. The controls here are weird, probably due to my emulator, but I'm not too familiar with the old Apple II computers to know for certain. Up was enter, down was slash, but the left arrow moved to the left, and the right arrow moved to the right. It wasn't too hard to use, just a bit odd. Then, looking at photos of the Apple II or Apple II Plus, this arrangement actually makes sense, since there are no up or down arrows. Return is above the left and right arrows, and slash is below it, albeit a bit off to the side. Aside from some minor differences in the font and sounds, and using blue for water and green for trees and bushes, it's pretty much the same game I played through. Oh, and Intelligence is abbreviated here, so keeping that in the Atari 8-bit version would have saved some embarrassment, I think. I tried the Commodore 64 emulator I used previously, CCS64, and could not for the life of me figure out how to load from disk 1, then switch to disk 2 to continue using it. Pressing any of the keys to select a disk simply didn't work, so I got stuck there. Using a different emulator, when Vice posed a different problem for me. I could not figure out how to move. Looking it up online, things mention that you use Joystick 2 for some reason, so I set up two joysticks and Joystick 2 does nothing. Pressing left, down, or right on Joystick 1 I'll say illegal command, up on Joystick 1 does nothing, and the button passes. Not promising. After pressing every key in combination, I found that Control left bracket moves me west but makes the screen blink. Control right bracket moves me east and also makes the screen blink. Slash moves me down, and Control F also moves me east, but the screen doesn't blink at least. I could not find out how to move north, so this completely prevents me from playing. Looking at images of the C64 keyboard doesn't tell me anything about how to move, since there is an up button, but it's up and pi. Pressing up doesn't work, and I don't know about your keyboard, but mine doesn't have a pi key. Okay, maybe showing a picture of the same model as my keyboard doesn't prove anything. In any case, all of the manuals I found online don't include instructions for the C64 version. I just cannot test this version. I've spent over an hour, loads of searches, and two emulators trying to get this to work. And just as I was closing everything up, I saw something that actually showed me how to move. You press Shift 2, the at sign. Somehow, I missed that. So, to recap, to move around, at least in Win Vice, I have to press Shift 2 for at sign to move up, Control left bracket to move left, but it flickers, Control F to move right without flickers, and just slash to move down. Oh, fiddly fun diddly fun. I start finally playing and fighting a couple orcs for the recording, jump into the portal, and then have to wait 45 seconds for it to load.
Doing my typical visit to Lord British for some health and getting back takes a whole eight minutes. Now, maybe I'm just spoiled on the Atari emulator, which patches the ROM to load from the disk almost instantly, but even on the real Atari, it only takes about eight seconds to load new world maps. The sound is alright, but colors are very odd, with lots of things filled in with color, and everything has a washed out look compared to the other versions. I heard that this version was released before it was completed, but aside from the lack of an intro, the strange control scheme, and maybe the very long loading times, I don't know what else was incomplete about it. I've seen one site say that this is the best 8-bit version, and I'm sorry they're wrong or the emulators are a lie. I don't know which it is, but no. N no thank you. The MS-DOS version doesn't seem too bad except for the sounds, which aren't great anywhere anyways. In DOSBox the water is blue, the trees and bushes are green, so it looks decent. It's very similar to the Apple II version in any case. Apparently on some monitors, the water ended up looking red due to how some monitors display CGA graphics. Viewing your inventory switches to 40 by 25 text mode, which looks a bit odd, but it seems to work just fine. I didn't play very far on it, but it seems serviceable depending on how slow you make the processor. At higher speeds, it isn't playable since trying to attack passes faster than you can pick a direction most of the time. Some people said they are also experiencing occasional division by zero crashes, but I never saw them. At around 300 cycles in DOSBox, it felt pretty good at least. Oddly enough, the portal that normally takes you to Pangaea takes you to the Time of Legends instead and shows water under you when you take it. There is also a fan-made EGA patch available for Ultima 2, which makes it look a little better. This requires a faster processor, and since the sound effects are based on the processor speed, they sound a lot different. Other than the sound, which wasn't that great in the first place, this seems like a worthwhile upgrade as well if you really want to try it out in DOS. The Atari ST version is... special. It took me a little dinking around to figure out how it works. You click or hold the button down to move, and can even move diagonally. There is an intent drop-down that defaults to attack in the overworld, and transact in a town, that you activate with a left click on or past NPCs. You can attack diagonally also. To enter cities or use mounts, you double click on yourself while standing on top of them. To pass, just click on yourself. So basically the entire game is played with the mouse. When attacking an enemy, it always shows a splat kind of red thing over the enemy, regardless of whether you hit them or not. This doesn't seem to make a different sound either, so you have to watch the bottom text to tell if you are hitting or getting hit. I like that your possessions are always visible off to the right, otherwise I really don't care for how you play this version. The Macintosh version is very similar to the Atari ST version. In fact, it was apparently ported by the same person, Robert Eric Heitman, who calls himself Bobbit here. In the ST version, he doesn't mention Bobbit at all, but that is also the name that shows up on the C64 version I could only barely play. A Bobbit is what a Hobbit is called in Ultima 3 because every race in that game needed to start with a unique letter. The Mac version is at a higher resolution, so more information is on the screen. You could always see all of your items and stats, which is nice. The sound is annoying here, and so are the enemies. It took me over two minutes to kill two orcs, and I know this is a new character, but it doesn't take very long on any of the other versions of the game. Turning the sound off didn't make combat go any faster. Aside from the nearly unplayable C64 version, this is the worst version to play. Richard Garriott wanted owning the game to be a bit more of an experience than some printed pages and a disc in a plastic baggie, the way his first Ultima game was sold and apparently a lot of computer games in the late 70s were sold. The game itself was inspired by the movie Time Bandits, so Richard wanted the game, a real manual and a cloth map, to come in an actual game box. Because of this he had trouble finding a publisher that would support that, but finally found Sierra Online who agreed to produce the game. Ultima 2 sold over 100,000 copies. Disagreements between Richard and Sierra led him to split ways when producing his next game, Ultima 3, which he did under his own new company called Origin Systems. Throughout the series, he continued to sell the main Ultima series game with a cloth map and oftentimes another feely, such as a Ankh that came with Ultima 4, or a black agate resembling the black stone from Ultima 6. This was a great touch, but the true treasures were the games themselves. There have been a total of nine main Ultima games with two spin-offs reusing the Ultima 6 engine called Worlds of Ultima Savage Empire and Worlds of Ultima Martian Dreams, another two unique games called Underworld The Stygian Abyss and Underworld 2 The Labyrinth of Worlds, a couple alternate Game Boy Runes of Virtue games, a spin-off using the Ultima 7 engine called Ultima 7 Part 2 Serpent Isle, and lastly Ultima Online in 1997, the game that coined the acronym MMORPG and is still running after 20 years at the time of this video. 
Almost all of these, with a couple of exceptions of course, are great games, far exceeding Ultima 2 in every way. Ultima 7 in particular is widely considered the greatest computer role-playing game that's ever been released. When Richard went to the aforementioned computer camp, someone said hi to him and he replied with hello. For one reason or another, everyone at the camp decided to start calling him British after that, so the nickname stuck. When he created the first Ultima game, the world was split into four continents, and he was the lord of one of them as Lord British. It's the name he kept throughout the Ultima series for himself, and also for the nearly immortal ruler of his game worlds. Well after creating Origin Systems in 1992, Richard sold his company to Electronic Arts for $30 million. Just about everyone involved with the company stayed through the process, and under EA, they released Ultima 8, Ultima Online, and Ultima 9. However, EA cancelled other planned Origin games such as Privateer Online, and Richard ended up leaving the company in 2000. He moved on to produce MMORPGs for NCSoft, where he stayed until another dispute over Tabula Rasa failing to be a success. He later created Portalarium and is still working on Shroud of the Avatar there. Since his father, Owen Garriott, was an astronaut, he always wanted to go into space. In October 2008, as a self-funded private astronaut, he flew to the International Space Station where he spent 11 days in space. There he recorded the first science fiction film shot in space, Apogee of Fear, which was available as a special on the DVD with his documentary of the experience called Man on a Mission, Richard Garriott's Road to the Stars. My wife tried playing his later MMO, Tabula Rasa which had a general British in it. From her experience, it was not a fun game to play, due to weird design decisions, such as making your weapon constantly jam every battle, or NPCs that would take over cities so you couldn't buy anything there, which wouldn't scale down when there weren't enough players to resist them, which happened regularly since the game was not very popular. Everything I read about his latest project, Shroud of the Avatar, that isn't simply PR hype, just makes me sad. Sierra Online was founded by Ken and Roberta Williams in 1979 as Online Systems. It wasn't long in 1982 when they changed their name to Sierra Online, and much later in 2002 when they changed their name again to just Sierra. The company has been purchased many times, starting with CUC International in 1996, then later with Vivendi in 1999, until they were both absorbed into Activision in 2008. Sierra is best known for their graphics adventure games such as the King's Quest and Space Quest series. They are credited with creating the first graphical adventure game, Mystery House, which was released in 1980. They also published a great deal of non-adventure games as well, as Ultima 2 is proof of. Over the span of their gaming history, they've released over 100 games, a few of which I'll be including in this series such as Heroes Quest and Goblins. So I have to warn you, the following is going to be a bit personal. There's nothing but credits in my outro after this, so I won't blame you if you stop here. Lord British was introduced to my family through the first good RPG we ever played, Ultima 3, back in 1983 or 84. Here he was the leader of the realm, and he leveled up your characters. Through the progression of the following Ultima games, even the spin-offs, everybody in my family played them, and Lord British was an NPC in just about all of them, always a friend who couldn't do much to aid you in your quests, but would heal you or bring you back to life in the later games. My sister Amber's favorite was Ultima 7.5, The Serpent Isle. My favorites were Ultima 6 and Ultima Online. My mother seemed to just love them all, but I think her favorite was Ultima 7 until Ultima Online came out. At one time, before she was 10 years old, my sister Juliet was asked at school who the leader of Great Britain was, and she didn't hesitate when saying, Lord British. One day, while my mother was playing Ultima Online on a test center, another player character named Garriott Richard ran by and caught her attention. She chased after him and started talking to him. They quickly became friends due to their mutual love for the Ultima games. His real name is Dachbjartith, and he lives in Iceland. And after my mother divorced my father, she moved to Iceland to live with him in 2002. So far as I'm aware, they were very happy together until her death from breast cancer a year ago in 2016. I didn't inherit any money, stocks, jewelry, a house, or anything else like that from my mother. I inherited something with far more sentimental value that we both shared together from our past. Her Cloth Ultima Maps. Thank you.